Okay, so I'll share my screen and we will start with the unit. Okay, so do you people have any doubts in the previous unit which we covered day before yesterday? Okay, in case of any question, you can unmute yourself or, or chi type in the chat box. Okay, so I'll just present my screen. Yes, so is this visible to everyone? Can you all see this? Yes, madam, please continue. Okay, okay. So we are starting with the first unit, that is unit number 17. And this particular unit will deal with major deficiency diseases. Okay, so as we know that, you know, uh, deficiency of any macronutrient or micronutrient. I hope you people understand that. What do we mean by macronutrients and micronutrients? So, you know, nutrients which are required in, uh, you know, larger quantities, these are referred to as macronutrients. For example, uh, protein, carbohydrate, fats, etc. Okay. On the other hand, uh, you know, certain nutrients like vitamins and minerals, like, you know, vitamin A, D, E, K, and so on. These are the things which you require in minor quantities. Okay. But that does not make a difference because both are equally important. Now, when we consume lesser amounts of these, okay, when you consume, uh, you know, less amount of these uh, vitamins, minerals, or carbohydrate, protein, and fat in your diet, then what is required for proper functioning, that will lead to deficiency, okay? So, in this particular unit, we are going to discuss about what are the different, uh, you know, deficiency diseases which are uh, prevalent across different sections. So, the first deficiency disorder which we are going to cover is by the name protein energy malnutrition okay so please understand that what do we mean by malnutrition malnutrition means something which is not correct mal okay so that means uh, this particular deficiency is because of deficiency of protein and calories in your diet okay so pem is uh, very prevalent among you know young children okay so though any form of PEM can be seen in case of adolescents and adults or maybe, you know, lactating and pregnant women. But mostly you will see that PEM is a deficiency which is, you know, very much prevalent in school going children. Okay. So why this deficiency occurs? Because for a longer period of time, the diet of the child lacks in protein and calories. Okay. And this deficiency leads to other, you know, type of implications like, you know, infections infestations and so on so when we are discussing about pem please understand that there are two you know forms of pem okay by two forms i mean there are two clinical forms of pe okay so what are these two clinical forms these two clinical forms are marasmus and kwashiorkor okay so the two clinical forms of pem are what marasmus and Shorker. Now, though in both of these conditions, you will see that the child's diet is deficient in total calories and protein, but you know, their sign and symptoms are totally different. Okay. So when I talk about Quashorker, you will see that a Quashorker, uh, you know, child is a child uh, who is characterized by edema. Okay. This. So what is edema? Edema is actually accumulation of fluid. So PEM has two clinical signs, marasmus and kosher. Okay. Both are because of deficiency of calorie and protein. The signs and symptoms are different. So when I talk about kosher, kosher usually occur in children, you know, between the age group of one to three years. Okay. And basically, Kwashiorkor has one of the characteristic features, which is edema, that is retention or accumulation of fluid in the body. Okay. Now, what will happen is that, you know, because there is retention of fluid in the body. Okay. So when you see this particular type of child, you will see that child seems to be healthy. Okay. He or she is chubby, right? But that is not his or her true way. That heaviness, that puffiness or cheekiness is because of excess amount of you know fluid which is retained in the body okay but in case of marasmus you will see that this child is grossly wasted okay what do we mean by wasting wasting stands for low body weight for age okay so according to the age of the child this particular child has severely low weight according to his or her age okay and this particular you know condition is characterized by excessive loss of subcutaneous fat okay so you will see that this particular child 
has very severe muscle wasting, okay, and there is no presence of edema, okay. So we must understand that the basic difference between Kwashiorkor and Marasmus is Marasmus you will see in very young children, you know, up till the age of one year or so, uh, which we call as infants, okay. While in case of Kwashiorkor, this usually occurs in older children up till the age of three years or so. The other difference is what? That edema is present in case of Kwashiorkor, while in case of Marasmus, there is no sign and symptom related to edema, okay? And this is related to what? This is basically related to uh, loss of subcutaneous mass, okay? Now, there might be certain children, you know, who are said to suffer from third type, which is known as marasmic kwashiorkor. Now, what is marasmic kwashiorkor? You know, this is a transition because we know that marasmus will occur in young children up till the age of one year, whom we call as infants, right? And second category is what? Kwashiorkor, right? And kwashiorkor age category is what? One to three years. So sometimes what happens is that when this child is shifting from marasmus to kwashiorkor, so during this transition phase, you know, a child might having certain features of marasmus and some features of kwashiorkor okay so this is mix and match of both these things and therefore we say that the third type can also be marasmic kwashiorkor okay so <clears throat> here we understood that pem exhibits in two clinical forms majorly which are marasmus and kwashiorkor and the third one where you will see children exhibiting signs and symptoms of both either marasmus and kwashiorkor is also there okay but these are what these are clinical forms of energy malnutrition which is commonly known as pem what do i mean by clinical clinical means which is visible okay so when you see this child there are certain you know prominent sign and symptoms which are visible by which you will be able to identify that this particular child is either having kwashiorkor or marasmus so that is why these are what these are two clinical forms of pem okay now, uh, moving on further, there is also another term which is given that is known as subclinical forms of PEM. Okay. What do I mean by subclinical form? That means these children, they are deficit in, you know, total calorie and protein intakes, right? These children are suffering from PEM, but at present, they are not exhibiting any sign and symptoms, okay? So this particular PEM is hidden in them, okay? So they might not be showing any typical sign and symptoms which are related to kwashiorkor or marasmus, but still, you know, they have PEM, they, their diets, they lack in total energy and protein intake, okay? And we must understand that, you know, what happens is that in majority of the communities, you will find children who are, having this subclinical form of PEM. That means these children are suffering from deficiency, but they are not exhibiting any sign and symptoms, okay? So if a child is, you know, he or she has low weight for age, okay? So according to age, the weight of the child is less, which is known as underweight. Or if, you know, the child has a lesser height in comparison to his or her age. So according to age, the height of the child is not appropriate. So, you know, things like wasting, stunting, underweight, these are all what? These are subclinical forms of PEM. Okay. So, up till here, is it clear to everyone? Any doubts, anything? Class, I hope these things are clear to you. Otherwise, you can write in the chat box or unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Okay, so now uh, we are moving on to whatever we discussed, like, you know, what are the uh, specific signs which are related to marasmus. So as I told you, two clinical forms, kwashiorkor and marasmus. So first one is what? Marasmus. Okay, so by marasmus, I mean that there is excessive wasting. Okay, so what is wasting? Wasting means thinness of the body. So you will see that these children have no subcutaneous fat. Okay, so there is no fat under the skin. As a child, you will see that, you know, the child is all skin and bone because, you know, there is no layer of cutaneous fat. Then these children are very, very irritable. Okay, and they are very, very weak. So they are so weak that you cannot even hear their cry. Okay, then there is excessive growth failure. So we usually see that, you know, marasmic children, children who are suffering from marasmus, 
they will weigh only about 50% of what it is desirable for a normal child. So let's take an example. For example, you know, at this particular age, the child should weigh 10 kg. So a marasmic child will only weigh somewhere around 5 kgs. So we can see that there is, you know, excessive growth failure in case of marasmus. Okay. Then when, when I, this is a marasmic child. Okay. Then if I talk about Koshyorkar, so we discussed that one of the clinical features of Koshyorkar is what edema, okay? So as I told you that, you know, um, edema is one of the symptoms which differentiates between a Koshyorkar child and a marasmic child. Here also, there will be growth failure. The child will be weighing, you know, lesser than what he or she should weigh at that particular age. But, you know, it is better than the marasmic child. In a marasmic child weighs only 50%, Koshyorkar child will weigh around 60% of what it is desirable. Then obviously these children are very irritable and these, these children are apathic. Apathic means they do not have any, you know, uh, interest in the surroundings. Uh, Koshyorkar is also, you know, clinically signified by many skin and hair changes, okay? So when I talk about Koshyorkar along with edema, there are many, you know, skin and hair changes which take place. So we say that, you know, uh, the skin, it becomes very, very thick, okay? And basically it can also be, you know, peeled off, leaving behind the cracks or sores. So there are very, um, you know, major skin changes that can be seen. Apart from them, you will see that their hair are also very, very, you know, sparse and they can be easily pulled off. So when you see the hair of the color, uh, they have a very characteristic color, which is known as, you know, reddish brown color. Okay. So the natural color of hair is lost and it is somewhere, you know, reddish brown color, which we can see. And this is an indicator of Koshyorkar. Then moon face. So what I mean by moon face is, as I told you that there is presence of, you know, edema, there is retention of the fluid. So because of that, child may appear very, very puffy, okay, and resembling a moon face. In case of marasmus, it is old man face, okay, or monkey face. Why? Because in case of marasmus, there is excessive emaciation of the skin. There is no subcutaneous fat which is present. And because of that, excessive wrinkling of skin occurs, okay. So in that case, what happens is you will see that the child resembles an old man because, you know, as we see that when we age, when we become old, there is excessive wrinkling that takes place because our subcutaneous fat gets lost, okay. So you must know the differences between Koshyorkar and Marasmus from your examination point of view also, okay? And these are the, you know, basic differences which have been highlighted in your table, okay? So any questions up till here? Is it clear, class? At least you have to say yes or no, you know, so that I can understand that you people are understanding or not. Yes, you are good. Okay, okay. Now... After understanding that what are the basic, you know, uh, differences or clinical and sign and symptoms related to Koshyorkar and Marasmus, we must understand that, you know, what are the <clears throat> different, uh, you know, causes of PEM, why this PEM occurs, especially in case of children, okay? So basically, see, uh, as we know that deficiency of anything will occur when, it will occur when you are not consuming that amounts in your diet, okay? So energy malnutrition is nothing when you are not consuming adequate calories or you know uh, adequate amount of protein in your diet you will be becoming deficit in that okay and because of that we say that the first cause is related to what deficiency you are not consuming what you need to okay and one of the major reasons for that is what poverty because you know no matter whatever we tell the people around us to have good uh, you know quantities of food good quality of the food but actually the problem is what that food will cost money okay so if i'm poor i do not have you know good finances okay or good monetary income then obviously my face uh, my family will face certain difficulties in fetching that particular food okay so first and foremost you know cause of pem is related to what is known as poverty okay then uh, the second major cause which is related to pem is maternal malnutrition Okay, so uh, we should know here that whenever we are talking about nutritional status of our children, okay, so from where that nutrition start, it starts when the child is in womb, okay, so when as soon as you know, one uh, a mother conceives a child, from there onwards only, you lay the foundation related to nutrition in case of children, okay? So that is why I say that maternal malnutrition is one of the prominent causes which is related to PEM, okay? 
so uh, particularly during pregnancy okay if the nutritional status of mother is poor then obviously if you know her nutritional status is poor how can she have good stores for the child or what nourishment she will give to her child and that is why we say that you know a healthy child should weigh somewhere around 3 kgs and in most of the uh, you know in indian scenario also and uh, communities uh, worldwide we see that there is you know certain proportion of children who are born low birth weight that is at the time of the birth their birth weight is less than 2.5 kgs and one of the major reason for this low birth weight is maternal malnutrition so the second important cause is what maternal malnutrition third is infections and poor hygiene okay so particularly when you are feeding the child the complementary feeds okay so after you know for the four first four months to six months basically who says that you have to exclusively breastfeed the child that means for the first six months the baby has to be only given mother's milk breast milk okay but at the age of six months you have to start giving you know foods like mashed vegetables and certain things but you have to be very careful regarding hygiene and sanitation okay so because if you are following you know unhygienic methods of feeding the sanitation is not proper bottles are not sterilized this can actually cause frequent you know infection in case of children and as we know that infection will reduce the immunity it will reduce the all, all over food intake and that will have an impact on pem okay then next important factor is ignorance so as i told you that you know delayed introduction of supplementary food so we know that at the age of 6 months only mother's milk will not be able to provide sufficient, you know, nourishment to the growing child because the growth rate is very, very accelerated. So at that time, it becomes important for us to introduce, you know, the supplementary food in the child diet. Now, what happens is because of ignorance, most of the mother thinks that, you know, six months baby is too small. So, you know, I should not start with feeding. Okay. And this results in delayed feeding. So, you know, this delayed feeding will have an another problem because, you know, the child is not able to get nourishment from only mother's milk. You have not started to provide anything from the top and this will create a gap in what the child is consuming and what is his or her requirement. So, this will again take the child into vicious cycle of PEM. Okay. Then wrong child feeding practices. So, you know, uh, basically it is not only that you have to start with supplementary feeding or complementary feeding. It is also that what quality of food we are giving to the child. Okay. So, if we are uh, giving just a, you know, a piece of a biscuit or a cookie to the child or just a bread slice in that case, that is not what has to be there. Okay. So, when we are talking about supplementary nutrition for our children, we must understand that quantity and quality diet diversification what food groups are we including in that that all is very very important okay so these are the few you know uh, causes which we call to be very important in causing pem So, any doubts in the causes? Anything you want me to repeat and discuss? Okay. So, next thing uh, we are moving on to is what is the treatment for PEM? So, you know, uh, Whatever the causes, if you reverse that, that will actually become a treatment, okay? So, when I talk about any of the deficiency diseases, the, uh, you know, prominent cause of that is what? That that particular, uh, you know, thing, that particular nutrient is missing in my diet. So, when I want to treat it or I want to, uh, you know, prevent it, the major effect is what? That you please start introducing that in your diet and that can be corrected or treated, okay? So, when I talk about PEM, we know that one of the major positive factors for PEM is what? That there is deficiency of energy and protein in the diet. Okay. So if you want to treat it correctly, we must start giving calories, sufficient calories and basically good quality of protein in these children. Okay. So when I talk about, you know, calories, uh, you can give, you know, nutrient and sources like you can introduce some amount of 
oil, sugar, nuts and oil seeds, then, you know, other uh, fruits and vegetables which are rich in carbohydrates and so on. Okay. But when I talk about protein, that is a problem and that is particularly a problem in certain communities because we know that, you know, the good quality protein comes from animal sources. Okay. So when I talk about class one protein or good quality protein or protein of high biological value, that will come from where? That will come from animal sources, flesh food. Okay. So chicken, meat, fish, milk and milk uh, products. These are the things which are, uh, you know, good, which provide you with good quality of protein. But you know what happens is because uh, there is a, a specific section who might not afford these things. Okay. I do not have a particular income or, you know, monetary basis because these are expensive. On the other hand, and there might be also, you know, certain cultural and religious factors which do not allow me to consume animal food. Okay. So particularly in case of children, we have to be very specific when we are talking about protein. So if you uh, can afford, if you can give in, given the good quality of protein in terms of milk and milk products, fresh food, etc. If not, then the other way of, you know, improvising the diet of the or protein of the children is what that is related to cereal pulse combination. So what do we mean by cereal pulse combination that, you know, when you combine cereal to the pulses, okay. So for example, you are mixing rice with some pearls, legume or beans and things like that. What will happen? This will have a total impact on the quality of protein. So protein quality in case of vegetarians or people who are, uh, you know, typically taking plant based diet and not consuming animal food, they can have a good quality of protein when they are combining cereals with the pulse okay so that is a good way of improvising on the protein thing uh, so treatment involves all this then uh <clears throat> The other uh, section deals with how to prevent it. So, you know, obviously prevention is better than cure. Okay. And that is why we say that, you know, first of all, you should focus on the, you know, requirements of the mothers. Okay. So when a woman is pregnant, okay, she should consume good quality, good quantities of the food so that she can, you know, raise a healthy fetus okay she can have a baby who is normal weight and that will have a good impact on the total nutritional status of the child also the other thing is that you know for first few months again the child will be totally dependent on the breast milk okay so basically lactating mother should also be you know counseled to breastfeed the child as long as possible okay and at the age of six months which is the correct age you should include what you should include foods in the form of supplementary nutrition now after understanding the uh you know uh treatment and things like that the other important form is related to what infections so you know we know that uh, one of the major causes of pm is also related to infections so particularly in case of children you know infections like related to diarrhea or respiratory infections these should be treated very efficiently okay and lastly children should be properly immunized again you know diseases like tuberculosis measles whooping cough etc so that can also help in preventing the cases of P E N. So this was protein energy malnutrition. Anything you want to ask in this? Anything? So just to have a brief recap, you should understand that P E M occurs in two forms. Clinical forms of P E M are uh, Koshyorkar and marasmus. In certain, uh, in some children, Koshyorkar and marasmus both can be present. Subclinical forms include, you know, forms which are not clinically detectable, but the child coming from PEM. Yes, uh, yeah, someone raised the hand. Yeah, please ask your question. I think one of you raised the hand. Uh, is there any question? Yeah, I have question mark. Yeah. What is the uh, full meaning of PEM? I don't protein, understand. Energy malnutrition. Mm -hmm. Right. Protein, energy 
malnutrition. Okay. okay. Protein, energy, malnutrition. Yeah. So that means uh, when the diet of a person or a child lacks in protein and total calories. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for over over okay. a period of some time, if you are lacking in total calories and total protein, that means you are consuming lesser amount of these than required. So this will result in a disease which is known as PEM. And in case of children, PEM occurs in two forms. So you have Quashiorkar. Okay. Okay. And the second one is Thank what? You. Thank you, Uma. Anything else? Can I move ahead with the next efficiency disease? Okay. So, uh, after the deficiency of protein and energy, we are moving on to the deficiency, which is known as xerophthalmia. Okay. What it is pronounced as? Xerophthalmia. So, you know, xerophthalmia is nothing. It is basically, you know, a combination of different signs and symptoms which arise due to deficiency of vitamin A. Okay, so I hope you people understand that there are vitamins and these vitamins are of two types. Okay, can anybody tell me what are these two types of vitamins? Can you name any vitamin? Anyone? Any type of vitamin which anybody can answer? Vitamin B, vitamin A. Okay, good. So basically, the two classes into which you can, you know, uh, uh, divide vitamins are fat soluble vitamins and water soluble vitamin. So your vitamin A, D, E, and K. Okay, I'll write in the chat box. So A, D, E, K are what? These are fat soluble. So the first deficiency disease which we are going to study is vitamin A deficiency. Okay, so vitamin A is a type of a fat soluble vitamin. It requires fat for its proper, you know, or efficient absorption in the body. So when I talk about vitamin A deficiency, I see that most of the signs and symptoms of this deficiency are related to, you know, eyes. Okay, and that is why these are totally termed as what? Xerophthalmia. Okay, so when I talk about clinical features of xerophthalmia, I see that there are many, many, you know, different uh, stages which occurs. So basically, you know, here you just understand that, you know, there are two parts of the eye and in the simplest term, the black part is the cornea and the white part is conjunctiva. So whenever we are deficient in vitamin A, if you know I'm consuming a diet which is less in vitamin A, so over the period of time, that will result in a condition which is known as what? Xerophthalmia. Okay. And in xerophthalmia, you have different, different, you know, sign and symptoms. Like first is known as what? Night blindness. Okay. So as the name suggests, night blindness means that an individual suffering from this particular, you know, symptom cannot see in the dim light or around the dusk okay so he or she particularly in case of children if you know a child is a uh, very uh, not comfortable in playing outside okay after the sun sets okay or you know he or she might have certain problem in reading and writing not doing the homework that might be a sign and symptom related to this particular deficiency okay so this particular deficiency is what when you are not able to see in dim light that is why the name is what night blindness okay second thing is what conjunctival xerosis okay so please remember that xerosis the term xerosis means what dryness okay so when i say conjunctival xerosis so that means what dryness of the conjunctiva so conjunctiva is basically the white portion of the eye so you will see that you know there is dryness in the conjunctiva okay so there might be irritation and things like that so that is what we mean by conjunctival xerosis then uh the other thing is what by thoughts spot okay so uh, you will be seeing that uh, basically in majority of the cases there is you know a foam right we say foamy type of structure so there is you know this foamy type of structure can be triangular or irregular in shape so basically this uh, foamy type of structure appears okay basically on the white portion of your eye and that is what is known as by dots spot okay another uh, manifestation is what corneal xerosis so as we discussed 
xerosis means what dryness so when it was conjunctival xerosis that was related to dryness of the conjunctiva which is the white portion of your eye right and when i mean corneal xerosis that means dryness of the cornea okay that is the black portion okay then Lastly, you know, if all the above, whatever we have discussed above, that all is not treated or ignored and things like that, that can lead to a, you know, condition where there can be destruction of the eye, okay? So basically, an individual can become, you know, permanently blind if these things are not, you know, taken care of. And this is what is known as keratomalacia, okay? So this is like the final stage in which your eye get completely destroyed. And, you know, this is irreversible. You cannot reverse that after, you know, taking supplementation or whatever. So this is an irreversible stage where there is, your eye has been completely damaged and that can lead to permanent blindness. So these are the signs and symptoms related to deficiency of vitamin A, okay? So I'll just repeat that deficiency of vitamin A is clubbed under a term which is known as what? Xeropthalmia. So all the signs and symptoms which are related to your eyes, particularly because of uh, vitamin A deficiency, these are termed to be what? Xeropthalmia. Xeropthalmia has different manifestations. So you have night blindness, okay? You have conjunctival xerosis, you have bipod spot, corneal xerosis, and finally we have what is known as to be keratomalacia. Any doubts? Anything you want to ask him? Anything last? Can I move ahead? Yes, yes. You can move more. Okay. So now the next thing again we have to understand that why this disease occurs. Okay. So again, why this disease will occur? Because this is a deficiency of vitamin A, right? So if you are not consuming adequate amount of vitamin A in your diet, you will have this disease, okay? Because this leads to deficiency. So primary cause of xerophthalmia of vitamin A deficiency is what? Dietary inadequacy of vitamin A, okay? Can anybody tell me that what are the different sources of vitamin A? Anyone? Can you please, uh, any one of you tell me few sources of vitamin A in your diet? Anyone class, from where do you get vitamin A? Anyone? Anyone? Yes or no, otherwise I'll tell you. See, when I talk about vitamin A, yeah, please. Is that what Thomas you want to say? Yes. Yeah, yeah carrot. Others? So, you know, things like uh, animal foods, okay? So, basically, your egg, meat, fish, milk and milk products, these are high in vitamin A. Otherwise, the ample source of vitamin A in our diet is related to green leafy vegetables, okay? So things like spinach, fenugreek, etc. So, all your GLVs, these are, and also your orange and yellow colored fruits and vegetables, okay? So, things like carrot, okay, uh, radish leaves, spinach, fenugreek, these are the things which have, you know, very good amount of vitamin A, okay? So, one of the major causes of vitamin A deficiency is related to what? Inadequacy of vitamin A in your diet. Second reason is again what? Maternal malnutrition. So, you know, studies, research has shown that, you know, uh, if mother is consuming less amount of, you know, vitamin A during her pregnancy, so that can also result, you know, lower stores for vitamin a in the child okay and basically when this mother starts to you know breastfeed then her diet should also have good quantities of vitamin a otherwise you know the breast milk that is you know secreted that will also have lesser amounts of vitamin a so particularly in case of you know uh, mothers when she is pregnant and when she is lactating she should focus on consuming good quantities of vitamin a 
then you know the other uh, important cause related to vitamin a deficiency is what infection and infestation so you know again if you know a child is suffering from infection again and again like respiratory infections or diarrhea or you know there might be some roundworm infestation or worm infestation so all these things actually lead to decreased absorption of vitamin a okay so whenever a child is having repeated diarrhea or you know repeated uh, intestinal infections or respiratory infection these things actually decrease the absorption of vitamin a in the body okay so the other prominent reason for vitamin a deficiency is what infection and infestation so the three you know uh, causes which have been discussed related to vitamin a deficiency which is known as xerophthalmia are what first dietary inadequacy of vitamin a second maternal malnutrition and last one is what infections and infestation now what can be done for the treatment obviously uh, you know uh, in india okay we have a program okay which is known as vitamin a prophylaxis program okay so this under this particular program what happens is that all the children okay when they are first diagnosed to be having vitamin a deficiency so all these children are given you know uh, intramuscular injections okay so in that case they are intramuscularly given an injection uh, of 1 lakh international units this one okay and on the next visit they are given you know 2 lakh international units of vitamin a by mouth so this is what has to be done if you see that you know there is some child who has come to you with uh, this particular deficiency how do we prevent vitamin a deficiency the first thing is what that obviously consume good quantities of vitamin a so make sure that if you are able to you know afford you can go in for better sources of vitamin a like meat fish milk etc if not the other inexpensive sources include all these so you know see it has been marked here so basically green leafy vegetables yellow vegetables all you know yellow colored fruits like papaya mango etc these are particularly rich in vitamin a okay can you see that this is written beta carotene right so and this is also there that you know beta carotene is a precursor of vitamin a okay so what do i mean by this thing precursor so please understand that i told you that you know the different sources of vitamin a are what milk and meat nuts green leafy vegetables etc right so the two sources from which vitamin a comes are what first are animal sources animal food and second is what plant sources so when i talk about animal foods these have a source or these have vitamin a in the form of retinol i'm just typing in the chat box retinol okay so your milk and milk products meat or animal foods they have what type of vitamin a they have vitamin a in the form of retinol okay but when i talk about plant food okay so plant food i mean what uh, i mean you know glvs green leafy vegetables okay or you know things like mango pumpkin yellow colored fruits and vegetables so these are all what these are vegetarian sources so these also have vitamin a but the vitamin a which is present is in what form beta carotene so please remember vitamin a exists in two forms retinol and beta carotene milk and milk product or animal food will have what retinol okay the plant sources also have vitamin a but that is in the form of beta carotene okay so beta carotene is basically known as precursor of vitamin a if you can see that okay so what do i mean by precursor always remember that in your body okay vitamin a gets absorbed in the form of retinol okay so whether i am eating you know milk meat fish etc my body will directly uh, you know recognize that and it will absorb that but when i am consuming uh, plant based sources okay so when i am using you know a uh, green leafy vegetable pumpkin mango etc these will have what type of vitamin a this will have beta carotene so why it is known as a precursor because first in our body beta carotene will be converted into retinol okay and then only your body can absorb that is this is clear to all of you class is this concept of retinol and beta carotene clear because this is an important one
Last are you listening? Is this clear? Okay. So I suppose that this isn't clear to you. So this was your two deficiency disorder which have been discussed in unit number 17. First one was PEM and second one is xerophthalmia that is vitamin A deficiency. Now we are moving on to the next one or next unit that is unit number 18. So in this uh, we will be covering other micronutrient or uh, this thing. So first one is related to what is known as to be nutritional anemias. So the next uh, deficiency which we are uh, going ahead with is what is known as to be anemia. Okay. So can you see this term? This is known as what? Nutritional anemias. So what is anemia? Anemia is, uh, I think I discussed this in uh, last class also when we discussed uh, the chapter which was related to pregnancy. Okay. So basically, anemia is a condition where hemoglobin levels of the blood fall below the normal. Okay. So if you remember, I had discussed that in case of women, non-pregnant, non-lactating, the normal hemoglobin level according to World Health Organization should be 12. Okay. So if, and in case of men, it should be 13. Okay. So it should be greater than 12 and greater than 13 in case of men and women. When this hemoglobin levels fall, then this condition is known as what? Anemia. Okay. So please remember that anemia is a condition when your hemoglobin levels fall and i had discussed this in pregnancy chapter also that why this hemoglobin is important because this hemoglobin is a pigment that will give red color to the uh, red blood cells okay and also this will help in carrying oxygen so whenever you are less on hemoglobin your oxygen capacity decreases okay now uh Basically, when I look into different, different signs and symptoms, whenever a person has anemia, so anemia can be, you know, due to deficiency of uh, different nutrients. The most common one are related to iron deficiency anemia, folic acid deficiency anemia. Okay. So basically, and vitamin B12 deficiency. So, you know, deficiency of any of these nutrients can lead to low hemoglobin levels, but the most prominent one are related to your folic acid deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. So this particular section gives you different signs and symptoms which are related to anemia. So, you know, anemia provides red color. Okay. Red, it is a red pigment. So whenever there is reduced amount of, you know, anemia, uh, reduced amount of hemoglobin, you will see that there is, you know, a, a paleness of certain parts. So you will see that there is, you know, yellowishness or paleness in particularly uh, related to your skin, or eyes and so on. So you can say that, you know, this particular person is low on hemoglobin. Okay. And then, you know, there is continuously a feeling of pins and needles. Okay. So particularly in your fingers and toes, there is this constant pin and needle um, uh, feeling which is there. Uh, the nails. The nails, particularly of your fingers and toes, they become very, very brittle and spoon shaped. Okay. Then obviously the tongue may also appear to be very, very smooth and, you know, glazed because there is, you know, destruction of the projections of the tongue. So these are basic, you know, sign and symptoms which are related to anemia. In, you know, very severe cases when anemia, uh, when hemoglobin levels fall very, very drastically, that can even lead to death. Okay, so particularly in case of pregnant women, adolescent girl, etc., it is very important to have your hemoglobin levels checked. Okay, now what are the causes? So, as I told you, that anemia can be caused due to deficiency of you know different nutrients. That is why in your uh, manuals it has been termed as what nutritional anemias nutritional means nutrient. So, you know, because of deficiency of certain nutrients in your diet, this is leading to lower levels of hemoglobin. So the three most important causes of anemia are related to deficiency of, uh, you know, folic acid, vitamin B12 and. So now uh, when I talk about, you know, 
different uh, uh, you know uh, causes okay so that means either your diet is deficient in iron which is common one or it is folic acid or vitamin b12 so particularly when i talk about anemia what are the different things that is related to this particular problem is dietary inadequacy so obviously your diet will be lacking in either and um, you know iron or folic acid or vitamin b12 now what is the problem related to iron is that always remember that iron deficiency anemia is the most common type and uh, one of the prominent causes of iron deficiency anemia is what that we are consuming less amount of iron that when it is required so you know when i talk about iron please understand that the good quality of iron will come from animal food okay organ meats okay so if i am a person who consumes animal food like you know meat fish poultry organ meats etc i will have good form of iron okay yeah. but <coughs> particularly in case of you know people who are vegetarian who are on plant based diet who do not consume you know meat or organ meats in that case you know there are very restrictive uh, intake of iron so that can have a basic problem related to dietary inadequacy okay then in certain cases uh, where there is you know high loss of iron that is taking place so maybe you know your intake is fine but the problem is what that there are major losses of iron which occurs okay so iron loss from the body can also result in anemia so in case of women who have heavy menstrual losses okay or in case of you know pregnancy when during you know birth or delivery of the child there might be you know a huge amount of iron that gets lost because of a blood loss etc so these are the different causes which can lead to you know lesser amount of iron in our body okay then uh, as far as folic acid and vitamin b12 are concerned please remember that for for folic acid okay the common foods which will contain you know folic acid include green leafy vegetables <coughs> so basically particularly in case of people who consume less amount of you know vegetables milk or animal food they will have less amount of folic acid as far as vitamin b12 is uh, you know a concern please mark this to be important please remember that vitamin b12 okay it is present only in the food of animal origin so none of your plant sources will have vitamin b12 from where vitamin b12 will come if i am a vegetarian plant sources microbes so you know uh, basically there is some amount of vitamin b12 that is synthesized in the intestine okay and the other thing which is related to vitamin b12 is what that uh, you know the problem with vitamin b12 is what that whatever you know quantities of vitamin b12 you are consuming it will get absorbed in your intestine but it will be only absorbed in vitamin uh, in your intestine in the presence of a specific substance which is known as intrinsic factor okay so always remember that vitamin b12 deficiency is though very uncommon right but still it occurs and why it will occur is because we have very restricted sources of you know vitamin b12 and then other issue is what that for absorption of vitamin b12 i require a factor which is known as intrinsic factor which is released from your stomach okay so if this there is any problem with this intrinsic factor you know there is some surgery of the stomach some some cancer whatever so this might lead to the release of this intrinsic factor okay so this might hamper the release of this particular you know factor which is known as intrinsic factor and if there is any problem with the intrinsic factor your body will not be able to absorb vitamin b12 okay so this is the problem which is related to this thing how to prevent it the first thing is what dietary measure so please ensure that your diet has you know good quantities of and good quality of iron also folic acid also and vitamin b2 then you know there is other thing which is known as fortification okay so fortification is actually a method uh, you might come uh, you might know about you know different different uh, things which are fortified so in your area in your region and country of residence you might be having uh, you know different different foods which are stated to be fortified with vitamin a iron and things like that so basically these are related to you know breads and buns breakfast cereals in india we have a fortified salt which has been fortified with iron and iodine now so fortification means what when you are you know improving the nutritive value of that particular food or diet by adding that particular nutrient into the food item okay so originally that food item 
for example if i talk about fortified salt in india so we know that naturally salt does not have iodine or iron okay so we have added that iodine and iron and made it to be a double fortified salt so this process is known as what fortification so first measure is through diet and second is what if you are fortifying your food products then the most common technique related to you know prevention and cure of this anemia is what uh, a distribution of iron and folic acid tablets so basically uh, we have different different programs which are run by government of india wherein we distribute these iron folic acid tablets so basically you know these contain a part of iron and a part of folic acid and according to the target group like you know pregnant and lactating women are uh, advice to have these you know for 100 days okay daily on daily basis if i talk about women of reproductive age but they are not pregnant and lactating they are given this particular supplements once a week and so do you know adolescent girls okay so even adolescent girls are advised to take you know one uh, tablet of these iron and folic acid tablets on the weekly basis so this is all related to what distribution of iron folic acid tablet that means for supplementation so this was iron deficiency anemia so anything you want uh, me to repeat and discuss you're most welcome please you, raise your hand and you can ask me questions or if you want to add anything anything class which is not clear you want to you want me to repeat Class, please, if you have any questions, you have to interact, okay? So please let me know whether you are understanding, not understanding what. Is this clear, class? Yes or no? You can write in the chat. Yes, it is okay, sir. It is okay, ma'am. It's clear? Okay, good. So now... After understanding, you know, three of the major deficiency diseases like protein energy malnutrition, then vitamin E deficiency, and then nutritional anemias, we are moving on to the next one. So this is related to deficiency of iodine, okay? And this is known as what? Iodine deficiency disorder. So when I talk about iodine deficiency disorder, which is commonly referred to as IDD, okay? Uh, so basically... <clears throat> In your certain parts in India also, we have uh, the deficiency problem to be very, very uh, widespread, okay? Now, why does this happen is because you must understand that this is because of the deficiency of iodine, okay? Iodine is also a micronutrient. Now, why this iodine is important? Because this iodine is required for the proper functioning of a gland i i suppose you people understand that we have different glands in our body which secrete different different hormones okay and these hormones will help in you know uh, regularizing different different functions in your body so when i talk about iodine iodine is required for the normal functioning of one type of gland which is known as what thyroid gland okay so this figure shows the placement of thyroid gland which is in your neck region okay so basically in the front portion of the neck you have this particular gland now why this is important is because thyroid gland secretes a hormone which is known as thyroxine okay and this thyroxine is very important for human health now what happens is thyroid gland will release thyroxine only if there is iodine which is present okay so if your diet is lacking in iodine this will affect the normal functioning of the thyroid gland as a result thyroxine will not be produced okay so is this clear so thyroid gland secretes a hormone which is known as thyroxine thyroid gland will secrete thyroxine only if iodine is present so you know if i am consuming diet which does not have iodine will have an impact on my thyroid gland okay so as a result what you will see is that whenever someone is uh, someone is having very severe deficiency of iodine uh, you will see that there is excessive you know uh, you can see here this page is not clear but still you can see that there is you know enlargement of the neck region okay so normally a thyroid gland may weigh some few grams okay but in this case it can weigh very heavily why because your thyroid gland 
swells up okay and because of that you will see that there is swelling in the neck region okay i have a uh, a powerpoint uh, word document which shows different different sign and symptoms i'll i'll show you that in while okay so basically uh, iodine deficiency will uh, result in this now why this iodine deficiency is uh, very very common particularly in indian context also particularly in the hilly areas because you know if i talk about uh, the sources of iodine like i said if you are consuming lesser amount of vitamin a lesser amount of iron that will lead to their deficiency so obviously when my diet is having lesser amount of iodine i may be deficit on iodine okay now why this particular problem is common is because you know the fruits and vegetables etc will have iodine which is dependent on the soil content of the iodine okay so whatever amount of you know iodine is present in soil Uh, you know where the crop is grown where the vegetation takes place so that will have an effect on the iodine content of that particular crop plant whatever you are eating okay so what happens is that particularly in hilly regions you know where there are hills and mountain regions uh, we know that there are floods and rains which comes off okay and because of that what happens is usually the top soil gets removed okay so when this top soil gets removed the top soil has iodine which is present so you know this uh, uh, rain or whatever this has washed away the top soil and along with the top soil what gets removed iodine so you know this vegetation which will grow in such areas will be low on iodine okay mm -hmm. then uh, <clears throat> the other thing which is related to iodine deficiency is what is known as goitrogens okay goitrogens is important from your examination point of view also so you should know that what are goitrogens i just type also goitro i have highlighted also okay so goitrogens now you know goitrogens are certain uh, you know substances which are present in your food that will interfere with the utilization and uptake of iodine okay so you might be consuming good or you know adequate amount of iodine in the diet but if you are consuming goitrogens in your diet so what will happen whatever iodine you have consumed your thyroid gland will not be able to utilize that okay so basically consumption of these foods in large quantities in some of the case can lead to deficiency of iodine okay so what are these goitrogens these are basically you know related to foods of the cabbage family so things like cabbage radish etc these are known to be high or these are the very common sources of goitrogens the good part about this thing is what that when you cook these goitrogens get destroyed okay so if you are consuming raw cabbage in very large quantities or very frequently or you know radish etc then these raw things will have more nitrogen activity in comparison to when you are eating them cooked okay so the second most common cause which is related to iodine deficiency is what consumption of goitrogens then clinical features so as i told you iodine deficiency disorders is what is known as to be deficiency of iodine and in that you will see that in case of adult when there is you know swelling in the uh, you know neck region because of swelling of the thyroid gland that is known as goiter okay so in case of adult the iodine deficiency exhibits as what iodine and in case of children okay that is known as to be what cretinism okay so this is basically you know a very very uh, adverse effects of iodine deficiency that you will be particularly seeing in case of infants and children okay so basically iodine deficiency in case of fetus in womb will interfere with the brain development and uh, if you know mother is consuming diet which is uh, less in iodine or she herself is iodine deficient that can have an impact on you know, uh, the brain development of the child and this can also lead to irreversible brain damage okay so as a result uh, you know the child who is born uh, suffers cretinism which includes you know certain signs and symptoms related to growth failure they might be uh, you know related to speech and hearing okay there might be paralysis there might be you know neuromuscular discoordination and also this might include uh, cases of mental retardation okay now what is the uh, control or correct the way of uh, iodine deficiency is that firstly you consume good amount of iodine in diet that can be done using iodized 
so in case of india uh, the, there is a ban on use of you know unioidized salt so in india nobody can sell salt which is you know not iodized so we have fortified our salt with iodine and recently we also have double fortified salt which has been fortified with both iron and iodine so in this case you have to use the iodized salt then you know you can also uh, use different different supplements which can help you in improvising your iodine intake and lastly in some you know countries we also have provision of use of iodized oil okay so these are the certain prevention or corrective measures when you see an iodine deficiency so is this chapter clear to all of you now so in case of adults the deficiency of iodine is what we call as whiter in case of children this is what cretinism so in case of adult when we say iodine this is swelling of your thyroid gland particularly the neck region because of iodine deficiency while in case of if you know a child is born to be iodine deficit then you know uh, he or she may exhibit different uh, you know signs and symptoms and these may be very very severe that can lead to paralysis neuromuscular discoordination there might be hearing and speech defect and also you know that can lead to a child who is mentally retarded so this was your idd idd means what iodine deficiency disorders so everything clear anything class you want to discuss add on you can discuss from your viewpoint also if you have something you can discuss about please you're most welcome okay So, can I move ahead with the next efficiency class? Okay, so the next deficiency disorder that we are moving ahead is what is known as to be B complex deficiency. Like, you know, one of you told me that, you know, there are different vitamins, like you have vitamin B, C, and all. Okay, so in this first deficiency which we are going to cater to is known as B complex deficiency. So, B1, which is known as riboflavin. So, the deficiency of riboflavin in the diet is known as a riboflavinosis okay so as the name suggests what riboflavinosis and a means absent okay so that is why the deficiency of riboflavin in the diet is known as what a riboflavinosis okay now what are the signs and symptoms so you will notice that you know most of the signs of uh, riboflavin deficiency which is known as a riboflavinosis is related to your lips and mouth okay so the first is what angular stomitis so you will see that because of the deficiency of riboflavin in the diet the angles of the lips okay they become cracked so uh, you will have you know these cracked lips particularly at the angles of the lips and which is known as what angular stomitis the other things which include um, related to this particular deficiency is glossitis itis means inflammation stands for tongue okay so there might be you know burning a, a, a sensation or you know a rawness and redness in the tongue so that is nothing but glossitis then chiliosis chiliosis refers to a condition wherein you will see that your lips become you know cracked and they become red so all the manifestations of riboflavin deficiency is related to your mouth and lips now again what are the causes when you're obviously consuming lesser amount of riboflavin in the diet and good sources of riboflavin in your diet actually includes green leafy vegetables milk and organ meats now treatment in case of severe cases you should be giving you know one tablet of b complex depending upon how severe the problem is otherwise you should focus on the dietary or good intake of riboflavin the second uh, you know uh, deficiency is known as pellagra so you know we know that b vitamin b 
has you know different vitamins b1 b2 b3 etc so b1 is what riboflavin its deficiency is known as a riboflavin b2 is nicene and its deficiency is what is known as to be pellagra okay now when i talk about you know pellagra pellagra is a condition uh, of disease which is characterized by four d's okay so please remember that pellagra which is deficiency of what nicene deficiency i'm just writing in the chat box okay it is characterized by what four d's okay so what do we mean by four d's that means diarrhea insia dermatitis and death okay so these four are the symptoms which are related to pellagra okay by diarrhea i mean frequent pa pa passage of the school uh, stool dermatitis means you know things or infections which are related to the deficiency of uh, nicene which affects the skin okay so dermatitis itis means inflammation and there is you know inflammation of the skin so please remember that pellagra is characterized by four d's first is what dementia dermatitis diarrhea and finally if uncured this can lead to death okay? so this is a condition which is known as your pellagra so they have given you different different signs and symptoms so you can see here they have mentioned there is diarrhea okay then there might be dementia and this uh, the most common cause of pellagra okay so pellagra is because of what deficiency nicene deficiency so why this deficiency occur this deficiency particularly occur in you know people who have maize as their staple food okay so when i talk about <clears throat> so when i talk about you know deficiency of uh, nicene i see that this particular deficiency is particularly common in people who consume maize as their staple cereal okay so in you know mexican population this is very very common because in that case uh, this is a community which is dependent on you know maize as this their staple cereal so what happens is the populations who consume uh, very high amount of maize so basically maize has nicene which is in the bound form so what do i mean by bound form so you know this form is not available to my body for efficient absorption so my body cannot utilize this nicene so that is why this is very common and in certain you know other communities where there might be some problems related with amino acid which is leucine and isoleucine treatment is obviously what you can give nicotinamide Uh, which is a supplementation that is available in case where the deficiency is very very severe otherwise for prevention you should include good amount of nicene in the diet the third deficiency is thiamine deficiency okay and this is related to what is known as to be beri beri okay so by beri beri uh, uh i mean that you know this beri beri occurs in two forms so we have dry beri beri and wet beri beri okay so you can see here they have mentioned here wet beri beri or dry beri beri okay so what is the difference between two is dry and wet you can understand wet okay something which is wet so uh, in case of wet beri beri you will see again that there is accumulation of the fluid okay as we had studied in kwashiorkor and marasmus so you know if you remember in kwashiorkor there was presence of edema or there was retention of fluid there was accumulation of the fluid so similar in case of beri beri also you will see that there exist two form we have dry beri beri and wet beri beri so when i talk about wet beri 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 that is characterized by accumulation of the fluid okay and this accumulation or retention of the fluid can finally lead to you know heart failure or damage to heart okay and in dry beri beri you will have all the symptoms which are related to you know uh, weakness in the legs etc so that can lead to you know paralysis or complete uh, making the person to be completely bedridden so the two forms are what uh, dry beri beri and wet beri beri uh, beri beri which you see in case of children is particularly termed to be infantile beri beri okay infant so from there the name comes what infantile beri beri now this particular problem of thiamine deficiency which is known as beri beri is particularly seen in children or you know in people who consume highly polished rice okay because what happens is um, 
this particular vitamin uh, thymine is present in the outer layer of cereal grains okay so when we actually polish them or remove the outer covering to make it more acceptable what happens is when outer layer gets removed so does the thymine okay and this actually results in deficiency which is known as peri peri so basically the prevention is that to uh, consume you know rice which is not very highly polished or highly processed because that will help in consumption of better amounts of thymine in the diet so these were the three deficiency diseases which were particularly related to vitamin b okay so deficiency of riboflavin is a riboflavinosis deficiency of niacin is pellagra that is characterized by four d's and finally deficiency of thymine is what is known as to be berry berry okay so i hope this is clear to all of you clear class yeah please ask your question is there yeah okay may you just repeat the part of berry berry it's not that clear for me very very yeah i'll just repeat so berry berry is because of the deficiency of one of the vitamin uh, you know uh, b vitamins which is just give me a second yeah so this is basically because of the deficiency of vitamin which is known as thymine okay so i was just checking this clean so whenever you consume less amount of thymine in the diet that results in a deficiency which is known as beri beri okay so by beri 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 means i can't i can't because you know the body gets so weakened up that the person is a uh, very very um, you know weak physically okay so there exist two forms of beri beri first form is wet beri beri w e t wet and the second form is what dry beri beri now the difference between two is what that in wet beri beri because that is wet okay that can be related to water okay so in case of wet beri beri you will see that there is accumulation of the fluid okay and this accumulation of fluid can actually you know cause problems related to heart because you know there is accumulation of fluid in the body and that can actually lead to heart failure while in case of dry beri beri the signs and symptoms are basically related to you know neuromuscular things so a person can be uh, paralyzed or completely bedridden in the dry beri beri now why this problem uh, occurs is because you are consuming you know lesser amount of thymine and one of the major reasons for lesser amount of thymine in the diet is seen in the population who consume polished rice okay so we have something which are known as you know parboiled rice so in that case the outer layer is intact okay but in certain communities to have a uh, you know a uh, good look out for the rice okay or to make it more acceptable you actually polish that rice which is related to what removal of the outer layer of the rice okay so when you are removing the outer layer or outer grain of this rice what happens is thymine is present in fact most of your vitamin b complex is present in the outer layer of cereal and grains okay so when you are removing this outer layer automatically you are also remo removing what thymine so this results in lower intake of thymine okay so this is your um, you know thymine deficiency which is known as beriberi so is this clear now yes it is clear thank you okay others if you have any other questions anything else okay so with this i'll move on to the uh, next deficiency symptom so after beri beri we have vitamin d deficiency okay so vitamin d is also another type of fat soluble vitamin and when we have less amount of vitamin d it is basically related to your bone health okay so whenever there is deficiency of vitamin d particularly in case of children deficiency can lead to a condition which is known as rickets okay while in case of adult uh, the deficiency or the adult form of vitamin d deficiency is known as osteomalacia okay now you must have read this in your previous you know blocks wherein you studied about different macro and micronutrients so you know this particular uh, vitamin 
is also known as you know sunshine vitamin okay because you know our body is able to synthesize vitamin d in presence of sunlight okay now the problem is what that in countries where you know we do not oftenly see in the sun okay or in case of india also where we have in sun but you know we are not exposing our uh, body towards sun rays or sunlight we are covered or you know we have um, use of certain cosmetics which can uh, you reflect back the sun rays etc so this all can lead to deficiency of vitamin d okay why vitamin d is important because it is very very important for the absorption of calcium okay so when we talk about bone health we know that calcium and vitamin d are the two important micronutrients macronutrients why because uh, you know you might be consuming very good quantities of calcium in your diet but until unless you have vitamin d that calcium cannot be used off okay so for the proper absorption of calcium in my body i require vitamin d okay so most often you will see that it is not that calcium is a problem it is more of you know deficiency of vitamin d okay so uh this was uh, related to vitamin d deficiency uh they have given you an example see this is an example of rickets okay so you can see knock knees the knees of the child are you know knocked together okay so this is what is the manifestation is going to be uh then the next deficiency is vitamin c deficiency so vitamin c is known as ascorbic acid also and the deficiency of vitamin c is termed as scurvy okay so where you will get vitamin c vitamin c is basically present in all your fresh fruits and vegetables okay particularly your citrus fruit like you know orange or lime indian gooseberry or gooseberry uh, which you say these are all the sources which are very very high in vitamin c okay so whenever you have a deficiency of vitamin c that leads to a condition which is known as spongy bloody bleeding games okay so basically a uh, scurvy is a condition which is characterized by uh, bleeding gums okay wherein we have spongy and bleeding gums so as you as soon as you start with consumption of good amount of vitamin c in your diet this can be reversed okay so particularly uh, for people who do not consume fresh fruits and vegetable for a very long period of time vitamin c or ascorbic acid deficiency is very very common okay so in case of severe cases you can give them uh, vitamin c tablets otherwise the best way is to consume good quantities of vitamin c next we are moving on to the condition which is known as fluorosis okay and please remember this is the only disease which is not deficiency okay so up till here whatever diseases we have studied these are all deficiency diseases either you know that is lacking in protein or energy or vitamin or whatever so all these were what all these were because of deficiency of that particular nutrient uh, this particular disease which is known as fluorosis is actually because of excessive uh, consumption okay so this is the only uh, you know sign and symptom which is related to consumption of excessive amount of a mineral okay so when i talk of excessive amount of a mineral this mineral is known as fluorine okay so in your diet in your um, you know if your fluorine intake is higher than the recommendation okay this is what is known as to be fluorosis basically you will see that fluorosis will occur in two form you have dental fluorosis and you have skeletal fluorosis dental means related to your teeth okay so there might be mottling of the teeth that takes place the uh, the teeth might you know lose their shininess okay and there might be patching of the teeth that occurs so basically this is more of a cosmetic problem which leads to pitting and mottling of the teeth and this is known as dental fluorosis but in certain severe cases this might lead to another condition which is known as skeletal fluorosis okay so in this case you know the uh, person will have initially pain which is related to the neck region or stiffness of the back that can progress further and it can damage so the damage can be so harmful that you know a person might get completely be uh, bedridden okay so this is the only uh, disease of consumption of excess amount of fluorine now basically from where this excess amount of fluorine comes in so you know particularly the water we consume okay 
uh, that has fluorine in that. So that is why we say that the drinking water should have less than one ppm parts per million of fluorine. So in India, particularly in Indian region, if any you know region has uh, the fluorine content of the water which is higher than one parts per million, then it has to be defluoridated. Okay, you have to remove that extra amount of fluorine. Okay, the other uh, you know hidden sources of fluorine in your diet from where it can come includes your toothpaste. So anything you know which is related to foaming which creates foam okay so that will have presence of uh, you know uh, fluorine in that so when we talk about toothpaste when we you know brush our teeth we use toothpaste so that leads to foaming of that paste so that will have fluorine even you know uh, certain you know creams and things which are related to foaming your shaving gels etc they also contain some amount of you know fluorine but obviously you do not consume that okay so water is the major source which can lead to excess amount of this particular mineral the next is related to lutharism. Now, lutharism is again a particular type of disease uh, which impacts your nervous system. So it can actually damage your nervous system. And this particular type of uh, disease is related to consumption of a particular type of pulse, which is very predominantly consumed in India. So that is uh, known as kesari. This is the name of the pulse. Okay. Now, why uh, the consumption of this particular pulse leads to lutharism is because this particular type of pulse contains a neurotoxin. Okay. So, I hope you people understand what is a neurotoxin. Neurotoxin means something which can damage your nervous system. Okay. So, naturally, this pulse has a presence of a neurotoxin, which is known as BOAA. Okay, so this neurotoxin, which is known as what BOAA, can actually damage your nervous system. Okay, then why do we consume it? We consume this particular type of pulse in certain regions of India because you know it does not require any special attention. So, you know, agricultural laborers, work, etc., who are not paid well, okay, they have to survive and they survive on this particular pulse because this particular pulse can get, you know, vegetated in any of the conditions. So if there is a drought, there is no water irrigation facility in that very hard, you know, conditions also, this can grow very, very efficiently. So when I do not have um, very good finances, okay, I don't have money to food, but I have this particular crop which is readily available. So I will consume that. Unknowingly that this particular, uh, you know, crop has a presence of neurotoxin which is what boaa that can damage my nervous system okay so the damage related to you know your uh, nervous system has been characterized in different different stages okay so initially you know uh, when this uh, damage occurs there is a typical you know gaitiness or walking style which looks very very awkward so you will see that this person is not able to walk comfortably in very very initial stages okay then you will see that one stage will lead to an another one okay so initially there is a no stick stage that means a person is able to walk but obviously this walk is not very comfortable there might be jerky movements okay but you know uh, there is no stick which is required Afterwards, when the damage progresses, you move on to, you know, a certain bending of your knees and you cannot walk without the help of a stick. So that is known as what? One stick stage. Okay. The Just give me a second. Then from a no stick stage to a one stick stage, a person will move on to a stage which is known as two stick stage. So require you require the help of two sticks to move on. Okay. And finally, this can lead to complete you know, paralysis. Okay. The person might start to crawl. So the person will not be able to walk even with the two sticks. Okay. Uh, so there is a crawling stage which occurs, and that can um, you know finally end up in you know uh, disabling paralysis okay so that is why we say that this is a very uh, you know tragic thing the consumption of this particular pulse which can lead to lutharism now how you can prevent that uh, you know actually uh, the crop has been banned okay but still you know uh, because of certain profits and things like that we are not able to completely get rid of this particular crop so the other way which was thought was that if you know in certain regions we are not able to ban it you know, there is something which is uh, uh, propping this particular type of crop. So the other thing is what that you detoxify that. Okay. So this particular box tells you that how you can actually uh, reduce the toxin which is 
present in this particular type of dal okay so there is a method in which you you know you soak the dal in water okay which has been boiled for a particular uh, period of time and then you sun dry it so you know this particular procedure will actually reduce the amount of toxin which is present in that dal so this was what is known as to be lathariism okay so now uh, if you want to discuss anything, any doubts, and can repeat that, okay? So in this particular unit, we did vitamin B complex deficiency, which was riboflavin deficiency, A riboflavinosis, nicene deficiency, pellagra, and thymine deficiency, beriberi. Then we moved on to vitamin D deficiency, which included rickets and osteomalacia. Deficiency of vitamin D, which is known as scurvy, which is characterized by, you know, bleeding spongy gums, fluorosis, this is the only condition wherein you have excess of something, okay? So here, this was related to excessive consumption of fluorine. And finally, you have lotharism, which is because of consumption of a particular type of pulse, which contains a neurotoxin. So anything you want me to discuss, repeat, anything, you're most welcome. Yeah, please. <laughs> please, can you elaborate vitamin D complex Deficiency. Uh, B complex, what? Can you please write it? Yeah, B complex. B complex deficiency. B complex deficiency. Yes, ma. Okay. Yes, ma. Yeah. So when I talk about B complex deficiency, we know that, you know, in vitamin B, you have different different vitamins okay so why do we call this as b complex because you know unlike other vitamins your vitamin b will have different different vitamins so we have vitamin b1 b2 b3 b9 b12 and so on okay so in your manuals there are three vitamin b deficiencies which have been discussed so you have deficiency of riboflavin which is a type of vitamin b and this deficiency is known as to be a riboflavinosis okay then you have nicene which is another type of vitamin b and this is known as pellagra okay and the third type of vitamin b which is known as thymine results in a deficiency which is known as beriberi okay so vitamin b1 b2 b3 are different type of vitamin which comes under the category of vitamin b and that is why we call them as b complex is this clear Yes, it's clear. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? Anything else? Clear. clear. clear? Okay. Great. So next, uh, we are moving on to the next unit, which is related to nutrition and infections. Okay. Now, as far as nutrition and uh, infection is concerned, there are two things um, which are given in your manual related to measles and diarrhea. Okay. So please understand that this cycle. Okay. So this is known as vicious cycle of infection and malnutrition. As you can see that, you know, malnutrition can lead to infection and infection can also lead to malnutrition. So that is why we call this as what we call this to be a vicious cycle of malnutrition. Because, you know, this is a Continuous thing that can occur, okay? Why continuously this can occur? Because, you know, these two diseases can exist, you know, at the same time in the person, okay? And actually, the interaction between these two diseases actually, you know, alter the behavior of the disease. So that is why we say that this is synergist. This is, you know, malnutrition can lead to infection. On the other hand, infection can also lead to malnutrition. So that is why we say that this is, and vicious cycle wherein we can see that malnutrition can actually you know increase the risk of infections in a person okay and in the other hand if the person is infected again and again so this infection can also lead to malnourishment uh the second important thing here is related to what is known as to be you know effect of malnutrition on infection so you know if a person has you know malnutrition, then how it can affect the infection so particularly this is related to you know a reduction in the antibody production 
okay so basically you will see that you know the child can fight infections better who is well nourished okay in comparison to a child who is you know malnourished because a malnourished child will have a lower immunity okay so his or her immune power will be less as a result uh, you know uh, he might be having certain more difficulties it might be more difficult for that particular child to fight against infection in comparison to a child who is you know well fed who is a uh, you know healthy who is normal because in that case his or her immune power will be different okay then uh you know this malnutrition can also uh relate to you know in maintaining the integrity of skin and mucous membrane okay because what happens is that our skin mucous membrane these are actually you know these are acting as a barrier towards you know entry of infectious uh, infectious agents okay so it actually prevents the entry of certain microbes uh, or you know bacteria viruses etc in our body so again you know we see that the child who is malnourished you know child who is suffering from koshorker or marasmus etc will have this protective mechanism to be absent okay so there might be reduction in the secretion of this you know mucous membranes etc and they actually become very very permeable so they cannot stop the entry of these pathogenic microorganisms then pem and worm infection uh, infestations so you know we know that a child who is malnourished will be more vulnerable to worm infections so basically you know in individuals or in children who are malnourished this can you know slow down their digestive tract uh, integrity okay and then you know uh, this can also lead to a very environment wherein the worms can multiply okay so some of the common worm infestation which can occur in case of children include you know round worm infections etc uh, which can be of very severe duration and severity then uh, the other part which they are discussing is that what is the effect of you know infection on nutritional status so when i talk about uh, the effect of infection of nutritional status the first common thing that is related to infection is reduced food intake okay so you know not children even as adults you know if you are having certain infection in our body we have fever etc that is a clinical manifestation of infection so the first thing which occurs okay or which we see is what reduced food intake we don't like to feel having food okay so same is the case in children so when a child is suffering from any type of infections like you know respiratory infection or you know diarrhea etc the first which you will notice is what that the food intake of the child gets reduced okay so when the food intake of the child is get uh, getting reduced this will have an impact on the total uh, you know intake of different different nutrients okay so child may not like or he or she might not be able to tolerate food so as a result because of the low food intake the dietary intake also gets lessened up okay so as a result uh, there might be problems there might be deficiencies which can lead to other problems then you will see that in case of infection uh, there is also um, you know effect on the absorption of nutrients okay so particularly if a child is infected this can lead to you know deficiency of uh, certain nutrients why because your absorption gets reduced okay so particularly in case of deficient uh, in case of infections like that of measles and diarrhea you will see that certain important you know vitamins and minerals like vitamin a etc uh, their absorption is actually reduced off then loss of protein so you know particularly in case of uh, infections and fevers you will see that there is you know excessive uh, breakdown of protein that occurs okay so the protein are excreted that means they are lost from the body and actually you know during fevers and infection your protein requirement is on rise but the problem is what that because there is food aversion you cannot tolerate food the total intake is reducing down at the same time there is excessive amount of excretion of protein so that can actually lead to you know negative nitrogen balance or that can actually have impact on your health uh then is measles and nutritional status and diarrhea and nutritional status so both of these conditions are going to affect the nutritional status of the child particularly if the child is having poor dietary intake and the quality and quantity of the diet are not desirable then these are specific guidelines which are related to dietary consideration for management of infections so first is related to measles okay so now uh 
when we talk about measles if a child is having an infection of measles a uh, mother is always advised to continue breastfeeding the child okay so breastfeeding should not be you know uh, reduced on the other hand there should be you know adequate uh, intake of liquids okay to avoid dehydration and particularly if the child is having diarrhea so if a child is having diarrhea you will be uh, you know uh, recommending to have oral rehydration solution which is known as ors which is nothing it is a pack of salt and sugar solution that that needs to be given to the child because you know diarrhea can lead to severe dehydration and that can be problematic for the child when i talk about diarrhea again you have to see that the breastfed children are you know uh, continue to be breastfeeding you also have to focus on the proper dietary intake of the child so things which are very easy to digest okay uh, softly cook you know uh, things like porridges etc can be given to the child which are low on fiber okay which do not further aggravate the diarrhea also the ors so this ors is given in point number 6 so that is nothing that is a solution of sugar and salt that needs to be dissolved in water and given periodically to the child okay so this will actually help in rehydrating the child so um, this was a unit on infections and infestations so anything anything that needs to be discussed so these are very basic units just go through that if you have any doubts i can take this up in the next session also okay so uh before coming on to unit number 21 i'll quickly do unit number 22 okay so this is all related to maternal malnutrition and you know somewhere down the line we have already covered this maternal malnutrition in different different topics okay so we know that maternal malnutrition means you know malnutrition that exists in mothers okay so particularly in the uh, women of reproductive age group and particularly in the period of you know physiological stress like pregnancy and lactation this puts them at a higher risk of developing malnutrition and uh, this is the uh, you know major reason why uh, there is high mortality in this particular target group okay so that is known as what to be you know maternal mortality rate so uh, we have to see that now uh, what causes malnutrition is particularly in case of you know pregnant and lactating women when uh, the pregnancies are spaced too closely okay there is prolonged breastfeeding and both of these things can lead to depletion of you know essential micronutrients or nutrients okay so that is why it is very important to consider all these things if i talk about nutritional status of uh, you know indian women it varies okay it varies from region to region but on the uh, average this is a very some condition because you know if you look at the indian data we still have 50 60% of our pregnant and lactating women who are suffering from iron deficiencies okay or who do not uh, gain adequate amount of weight during pregnancy so all these things are related to your maternal malnutrition that will obviously have an impact on the uh, nutritional status of the child also okay so what is the heavy price of malnutrition that means if you know women are malnourished then obviously this will have you know babies who are low birth weight okay so maternal malnutrition is directly linked to the nutritional status of the child or the fetus okay so if this child is born low birth weight that means this child has a lower birth weight what it should be this can have you know this child can have greater incidences of infections they can be fewer development of the brain cells it can also have you know lower growth rate and also the incidences of mental retardation is also higher okay so now risk factors which are related to pregnancy okay these include repeated pregnancy closely spaced you know uh, births high infection rate heavy workload and also you know consumption of smoking and alcohol which is basically a behavioral problem okay this is a behavioral risk factor all this can lead to pregnancies which are complicated so uh, this is was a chapter on maternal malnutrition so this is just a glance at it if you have any doubts i'll take this up in the next session uh, you can just go through it okay we have discussed this many times the last technical unit which requires your attention is related to dietary management of obesity heart disease and diabetes mellitus and all these are also referred to what to be known as to be lifestyle disorders okay lifestyle means 
this these are not you know related to some deficiency and things like that this is our you know lifestyle which has impacted these okay so if you are consuming foods which are high in fat which are high in calories uh, you do not have adequate amount of physical activity and things like that so all these are termed as to be lifestyle disorders so the three major ones which we are going to decide are obesity heart disease and diabetes mellitus So I'll come on to the first one, which is known as obesity. Now, obviously, when we talk about obesity, uh, we understand that, you know, by being obese, what we mean is that obviously this person is having excess amount of weight. Okay. You can see someone and you can, you know, comment, you usually make a, you know, pass on this thing that, you know, this particular person is overweight or you are obese. So what do we mean by overweight and obesity? When you have, you know, higher amount of fat, okay, you weigh more than desirable. So that is referred to as being overweight or obese. Now, usually overweight and obese are the terms which are used synonymously, but they are different, okay? So, we usually say that if person weighs, you know, 10 to 20% higher than his or her idle body weight, okay? So, I hope you people understand what do we mean by idle body weight. Idle body weight means what it should be, okay? So, supposingly, in the case of adult, this, uh, you know, idle body weight is dependent on your height. So when I talk about, you know, idle body weight, it depends on your height, uh, mostly in case of adult. So if I say that your height is this and your weight should be, say, uh, 60 kgs, okay? But you are weighing 70 or 72. Or if the other person is weighing like 90 or 95. So obviously you understand that this particular individual is weighing more than what his or her idle body weight should be, okay? So when this uh, body weight is 10 to... 20% above the ideal body weight, you say this person is overweight. And when this exceeds 20% of your ideal body weight, then we say that this person is obese. Okay. Now, why this is a problem? This is related to, uh, you know, when we study about the risk factors. So basically, this is energy imbalance. Okay. So we have to be in a state of equilibrium. Equilibrium means your input should be equals to your output. Now, in case of obesity, what happens is that a person is in positive energy balance. You know, you are being overweight and obese. Why? Because one of the prominent reasons is you are consuming more amount of calories than what is required for you. Okay. So what happens is over the period of time, your intake is more than your output. From where this output will come? From your physical activity. So, you know, on the one hand, you are not physically active. You are consuming high amount of food uh, which are rich in calories, fats, etc. So over the period of time, what will happen is you will have a positive energy balance. So your input is more and your output is less. While in case of people who are underweight, okay, who weigh less than what should be their ideal body weight, the problem is what? Negative energy balance. So in those cases or in those individuals, what happens is that their intake is less but their output is more. But both the conditions are equally wrong. So there has to be a state of equilibrium. Your input of the calories should be equal to the output. The other reason is obviously overeating. So, you know, certain behaviors like, you know, consuming junk foods, So in certain individuals, when we see that, uh, you know, uh, they overeat and from where does this overeating come? This overeating will come from, uh, you know, munching in between. Okay. And we are munching on certain snacks, which are very, very high in calories. So, you know, between your major meals, I uh, we have a habit of nibbling on, you know, cakes or wafers or biscuits and cookies, etc. So all these uh, things lead to overeating. Then sedentary lifestyle is also one of the prominent reasons, okay? So, you know, uh, when we talk about overweight, obesity and, uh, you know, data globally, obviously, the reason is that you are, we are consuming, you know, diets which are high on calories and things like that. But the other important reason is also what sedentary lifestyle. We do not have adequate physical activity, okay? So, uh, from India also, you know, many studies say that, you know, 50% of our population is actually physically inactive because, you know, now uh, we have 
different modes of transportations which are available okay are all kitchens and everything has been mechanized okay and because of that the physical output is becoming uh you know rare or slower day by day psychological factors yes so we have seen that there are certain people who tend to eat more okay so that is dependent on their mood okay so whenever they are tense uh, they are stressed they tend to eat more okay and this can lead to high amount of calories there is also genetic influence which says that you know if parents are obese uh, the children have a higher you know risk of developing obesity because you know there are certain type of genes which are known as obesogenic genes okay which are being under study so we say that if both the parents are obese the chances of having a child who is obese or you know chances of child to get obese are higher than you know if his or her parents are not uh dietary management of obesity is related to you know you have to decrease the total calories okay so please understand that obesity is what problem obesity is a problem where your intake of calorie is more than the output okay so how you are going to correct it you are going to correct it when you will be decreasing that calories okay so usually you say that uh you know you if you decrease 500 to 1000 kilocalories in daily diet okay so whatever this person is consuming you have assessed that and if you decrease his or her calorie intake by 500 to 1000 kilocalorie on daily basis that will lead to a weight loss of half kg to one kg in a week okay so please remember that that whenever we are restricting the calories to 500 to 1000 in a day's diet okay depending upon the individual requirements uh, you will see that there is roughly a weight loss of half kg to 1 kg ideal body weight or uh, ideal body weight loss okay so usually one should scientifically reduce only this amount of you know weight so half to 1 kg is what is desirable okay and how you are going to achieve it when you are reducing the daily calorie intake by 500 to 1000 kilocalories and we say that you will never go less than 1200 kilocalories okay in case of women and less than 1400 kilocalories in case of men okay because that is their basal requirement that amount of energy is required for proper functioning and things like that okay so you have to restrict the total energy intake then you know uh because you are uh, you know restricting energy that will be coming from simple carbohydrates sugars etc you should include you know good amount of protein in the diet okay uh, the total fat also needs to be restricted and it is also related to the type of cooking method you are uh, using okay so no use of fat or oil for frying deep fat frying etc and also there should be adequate intake of vitamins and minerals now how you are going to uh, modify the diet of these patients who are obese or overweight is uh, you have to restrict the total food intake okay and this total food intake in case of obesity you will see is related to a fact that you have to cut on the calories and you know cutting out 500 to 1000 kilocalories in a day's diet is a tough job okay so you have to be very very rational and you know we usually say that do not cut the main meals you know usually you will find these people having a normal breakfast lunch and dinner but the problem is what in between nibbling of the snacks so you first correct their behavior tell them the options which are related to healthy eating options rather than having you know fried foods or uh, you know something which is very high on carbs or calories uh, tell them to offer fruits and vegetables greens etc which are not that calorie dense okay then you will also be restricting the total fat okay you'll be giving more amount of protein plenty of green leaf vegetables and also include amount of fiber in the diet okay because what will fiber do fiber will come from your whole cereals whole pulses you know fibrous fruits and vegetables and this fiber which actually will actually help to provide satiety the feeling of fullness so you know when uh, you are telling someone that you know have a bowl of fruits and vegetables in your diet okay so or salad in your diet so what will happen these are raw these are fibrous so after having a bowl of salad or fruits and vegetables you know this thing you will feel more satisfied okay so fiber adds fully so this person will not feel hungry again and again and that is why we say that fiber good amount of fiber is a good way of cutting calories so this was overweight and obesity so any doubts in this thing Any questions, class, in case of overweight and obesity?
क्लियर हो नो कैन आई मूव अड विद डायबिटीज ओके सो नाउ वेन वी आर मूविंग विद द नेक्स्ट थिंग विच इज वॉट वॉट what is desirable you need to cut down the calories okay you need to lower the calories because as of now their calorie intake is much much higher than their expenditure so how you are going to do that you have to restrict the total food intake how you are going to restrict this total food intake by you know cutting on the you know nibbling snacks in between the meals because that can lead to higher amount of calories okay Yeah, you're trying. Your your mic is on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, or you want to restrict the total intake of fat, increase the fiber. So, all these things will help in, uh, you know, maintaining adequate amount of calories or maintaining a energy equilibrium. now the next thing which we are going to uh, do is diabetes mellitus okay now basically what is diabetes it is elevation of blood sugar level which is actually blood glucose level okay now what happens is this is a metabolic disorder now what happens is that there is a uh, hormone which is known as insulin okay so basically the beta cells this is the site you we have pancreas okay uh, has been shown in this particular figure okay so the beta cells of your pancreas secrete a hormone which is known as what insulin okay so this insulin actually helps in you know metabolizing blood sugar level okay because to metabolize to control my blood sugar level i need to have what insulin now if there is any problem with insulin okay uh, you know my pancreas is not working properly or there is some problem with the cells of the pancreas it is like that so anything which can reduce the secretion of insulin will raise your blood sugar levels okay because my body will not be able to metabolize this blood sugar level because insulin is not present okay so this particular condition is what is known as to be diabetes diabetes is of two types we have type 1 and type okay so type 1 is known as insulin dependent diabetes mellitus okay now in this case what happens is there is complete shutdown on the secretion of the insulin you know so as i told you that insulin is required for metabolizing your blood sugar levels so in type 1 what is happening is that insulin is not secreted there is complete shutdown and what becomes important is that you need to have insulin from outside source you know uh, people have insulin shots who have diabetes particular type of diabetes require you to take insulin injections because my body is not able to produce insulin at all okay so this exogenous or you know insulin from the outside source is one type of diabetes which is known as what insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and the other type is what non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus is also known as type 2 diabetes okay so this particular diabetes is more common it is related to age like we say that you know after the age of 40 45 one tends to develop diabetes okay so this is that particular type of di diabetes which can be you know uh, cured or which can be managed by using certain oral hypoglycemic drugs you take tablets for maintaining your you know blood sugar levels or through lifestyle modifications so if you have good control on your diet you are physically active you have certain you know tablets or drugs which can metabolize your blood sugar levels you are good to go okay so the two type of diabetes are what insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus the different uh test which can actually you know uh diagnose the presence of diabetes includes urine test okay so normally urine not have any glucose which is present but in case of 
diabetics you will see that there is presence of the glucose otherwise you can go in for different different blood tests so you have plasma blood glucose levels and things like that or glucose tolerance test so these are the different type of tests which actually reveal the uh, blood sugar level okay risk factors are age so generally you know people in their middle age group 40s and 50s tend to have higher risk of developing diabetes malnutrition which includes both being overweight and underweight so undernutrition and overnutrition both will have an important role to play in diabetes we say that you know sometimes diabetes run in family so if your grandparents are diabetic or parents are diabetics you will have a higher risk of developing diabetes than gestation so by gestation i mean what pregnancy so you know this is a particular type of uh, uh, diabetes which can occur in pregnancy so particularly in case of pregnant women we tend to have a special you know case of diabetes wherein uh, you know pregnant women were normal before they had conceived so you know they were absolutely normal but after they conceived okay they are pregnant it is the first time that you see a rise in their blood sugar level so that is what is known as to be gestational diabetes okay now gestational diabetes um, usually gets cured after the delivery because you know the hormones get back to normal and there are different different um, metabolic uh, abrasions which get corrected so after the delivery of the child most of the women will have normal blood sugar level but few of them might have you know high blood sugar level for the rest of the thing okay so they might have to be continued to be diabetic thereafter also we also see that stress is one of the common indicators which are related to diabetes so whenever you are in some kind of emotional stress anxiety fear whatever depression so these are the conditions which can raise your blood sugar level how do you manage diabetes it can be either dietary management wherein you tell a person to control you know the total calories the type of carbohydrate the person is consuming or it can be a combination of diet and oral drugs that is tablets or it has to be dietary management with, along with the insulin okay so whether it is type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes or what is affecting what will actually determine your management now the treatment of diabetes is similar to obesity as you will see that 80 to 90% of the people who are coming you with diabetes are overweight and obese okay so the total calorie needs to be restricted whatever needs to be done it is same as your overweight and obesity but here the focus should be on carbohydrate because this is a carbohydrate metabolism your body is not able to metabolize sugar so in case of you know a diabetic individual you will never give uh, you know diet which provides less than 100 grams of carbohydrate in the diet okay because that amount of carbohydrate is the basic requirement for proper functioning of your brain okay so whenever we are restricting carbohydrates for diabetes these do not have to be less than 100 at least but not over than 300 also okay because that can lead to damage okay now here it is important to understand that what type of carbohydrate you are going to give so you have to give complex carbohydrate nothing which is refined sugar you know things like uh, refined wheat flour semolina etc so all these things are totally restricted because you have to give carbohydrates which are complex in nature okay which will not uh, you know raise your blood sugar levels instantly okay so the more refined foods you will take you will be in more problematic condition so as far as carbohydrates are concerned you have to give complex carbohydrate in comparison to anything which is simple sugar so obviously sugar and vegetables like potato sweet potato yam etc which are very very high on carbohydrates that all needs to be restricted fiber has to be very very good because fiber actually helps in lowering your blood sugar level okay because that is a complex carbohydrate so this was thing related to diabetes so anything uh, anything that you want to know or discuss in case of diabetes any questions anything class anything class is it clear yeah so we are left yeah. with last little thing that is related to your heart disease and that i'll take up in next session then okay so this is a small uh,
subsection that is left because if I start, I think time is already over. So I'll take this uh, section on heart disease in the next session. Okay. So that's it, sir. Are you there? Yes, madam. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much. So one section is left and that I think I'll cover in the next this thing then. Okay, madam. Okay. So nice, sir. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So thank you, everyone. I'll see you in the next session. Thank you, madam. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone.